Stop. I guess stop that recording. The person over there. I came out, Daddy, on, on Friday. I was like, I really need you to be the person running that because I'm yeah, working with computers. The minute you tell me I can connect something, I'm done. <laughs> it's over. Well, yeah, you're, 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 okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are uh, session two in our series on inclusion, which. Mm -hmm. Our model is our faith. Our model is justice. Uh, and our joy is the people that we have who keep it going for us. So this week, in me asking the question when we became an RNC congregation, which yours truly did the jig, um, I said, okay, where do we go next? Where Where is next? And the obvious answer was, we look to where it first begins in terms of understanding and also experience our children. So, Seth Jacob, we welcome you. Seth you. is a, what grade this year? First. First grade? <laughs> Always first. <laughs> Never even first grade. <laughs> she also has a degree in uh, being a librarian. She has a lot of background with uh, all kinds of good books. And so she's here to present today with us of how we could, even if you don't have grandbabies or children, you come in contact with children. <laughs> and we want our children to feel safe. We want our children to feel loved. We want our children to know that as in my family, what we say when we hug and kiss, I will love you forever and always just as you are. And we started doing that long ago. And that's how we are to be. Just as you are, we love you. Because I want to be loved just as I am. Okay, my friend, you're on. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to stand while I present because sitting makes me, gives me anxiety. So I am a mover. So please don't think I'm just, I'm happy to stand. Um, today's, as Daddy said, today's topic is just about talking with kids about LGBTQIA plus topics and incorporating it into just your family conversations, into your home libraries, things like that. So first, let me tell you about me. I am a mom of two boys. I have a 15-year-old named Asher and a 10-year-old named Micah. They could not be more different in personality and interests. So that's them. So I'm coming to you from a mom background. I'm also a teacher. I've been teaching for 18 years and did 11 years as a librarian. And this is my seventh year as a first grade teacher. And tell us where. Oh, Cheltenham Elementary School. <laughs> <laughs> I had the honor of teaching Claire in first grade, although unfortunately it was the year of the pandemic and we didn't get a full year together. Um, I'm a huge advocate for inclusion and diversity, not just for the LGBTQIA plus community, but for um, just racial diversity and inclusion, for socioeconomic diversity and inclusion. I'm on the diversity inclusion team at our school, um, and it's just something that is really, really important to me as a person. Um, I was a member here at the church of the RIC team. We worked really hard, if you don't know, to, um, we went through a year long process talking about um, how we can be welcoming and inclusive to people of the LGBTQI plus community. We had lots of conversations with lots of different people and about in June, I guess, we affirmed our welcome statement, which was so, so exciting to me. And I'm thrilled that we, through the process and now we're working as an RIC team to make sure that we don't just have it on paper but that we're living it out as a church congregation so that's part of the reason I'm here today because I think it's really important for us to continue the educational piece and last but not least I'm not an expert I I'm coming to you with my background as a teacher I'm coming to you with my background as a mom I'm coming to you with my background as an advocate but if I say or do something today that you're like I would never do that it's fine. I'm not the expert here. I just want to share information. Okay. All right. Well, we thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. 
So I stole some slides from um, Kathleen and I did a presentation for Sunday school. So if you were at Sunday school, I apologize. It's a little refresh. But I just want to put this up here as a starting point because I don't want to assume that anyone under knows or doesn't have questions about what LGBTQIA plus and 2S, I always forget 2S, I apologize, um, what that means. So you can take a quick look. I know the font is so small. I tried very hard to make it big, but I couldn't. Um, or do you have any questions? Are there any? <clears throat> the 2S, the 2S. Okay, 2S, 2S is, was it? brand new to me too, and I love it. So it comes from um, our native um, people, indigenous people's background. And there is, they, people with two spirits were thought to be holy. So they embody both male and female spirit. And so it is sort of taking that back and making sure that we are being inclusive of indigenous people when we talk about this and knowing that it, they had this sort of two spirit um, binary way before we came up with this. I just wanted to pop in here with the, uh, on Sunday, November the 13th, uh, uh, Bishop, not Bishop, I'm sorry, Pastor uh, Guy Irwin, who is the president of our seminaries now, the combined seminaries at Philadelphia and Gettysburg, will be with us <laughs> preaching at both services and hopefully visiting us here. And the reason I, I lift him up is that he is an openly gay married uh, gentleman who also is of the indigenous background. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Awesome. So um, <laughs> it took years, truly six months to get him. But <laughs> as we did, as yes. people know, maybe. Super persistent. <laughs> she, she doesn't give up. <laughs> so anyway, we have them. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, they wanted to do single service. I said, no, no. You know, this is who we are. Come to both services. So. Awesome. He has agreed. But anyway, here you go with indigenous. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's another way to be inclusive in our language, which is really, really important for us to be doing. Steph, how about the plus? The plus is, so this is an always evolving sort of binary, you know, people fall and new terms are coming out, new, new things are being included. And so this is just like to make sure that everyone is included in that. So if a new term came out and there's not a letter in here, it's just to say, you're still part of this. We still really value you. Okay, so I'm gonna start off here. I think this is really great for adults, but I also think that if you have a child and I will share my presentation with you, um, Dottie will help me make sure it gets emailed out. Um, I think this is a really great place for kids in particular to start off with talking about just sex and gender and sort of where we fall um, and what it all kind of means. So sex is what you're assigned at birth. The doctor looks at you and says, you have girl parts, you have boy parts, that's your sex. So that is sort of determined just by your anatomy. Then your gender identity is how you think and feel. So I identify as female. Other people may identify as male. Other people may identify as both or all. Um, it's just your thoughts and feelings on it. And I love that the little, I, I'm obsessed with these graphics. The little rainbow is like a thought bubble. So it makes it really visual for kids. Like it's how you think or feel about it. Your gen gender expression is how you sort of outwardly express yourself to the world. So I express myself pretty feminine. Um, there are lots of people, women who identify as female, but express themselves in a more masculine way. There are lots of men who identify as male, but still express themselves in a more feminine way. So it's really just your outward expression to the world. And then physically attracted to, so you can, this is like you're just instantaneous attraction to someone just based on their physical appearance. Um, and then this was new to me and might be new to you too, who you're emotionally attracted to. So you could be physically attracted to someone, but then you could also have a really strong emotional attraction to someone. And for some people, the emotional attraction is more important than the physical attraction. So that was like a new thing that I learned through RIC actually. And I was really intrigued by it because I think it's just really interesting to think that you could be physically attracted to a certain type of people, but then emotionally attracted to someone else. And that emotional attraction could lead to a relationship. 
And then this is our progressive pride flag. Um, the pro progressive pride flag was sort of invented. I don't come up by, by Harvey Milk. I have a great book about it. Um, it's also about the pride parade, but it talks about how the flag was invented. And the Tell flag who Harvey is. Oh, Harvey Milk was an activist. Please, please I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> he was an activist and he a senator who was uh, one of like the first openly gay politicians. And he was actually a huge advocate. He started the pride rallies. He wanted to bring um, gay rights and um, just queer rights to the forefront. And was respect. And respect. Yeah. And he did it in a really great way. And he was unfortunately murdered for his um, yeah. activism. Yeah. And so it shows, and this was, I forget what year, in the 70s so it wasn't yeah. even that long ago that just for being who he was and for ad advocating for this group of people he would, was like this taken yeah, so he was openly assassinated yeah mm -hmm. was it harvey what? Yes. no 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 okay. yes harvey milk there's a movie about him. Yes. yes there's mm -hmm. that was yes yeah. you're right london yes there's a great documentary so. So the progressive pride flag is really important for a number of reasons. One, it represents all the sort of LGBTQIA plus community. And so if you are a member of the queer community, you might fly the pride flag. But it's important for us as allies to be flying the pride flag because it signals that one, we are a safe place. We're a person or a home or a church that is safe for people of the queer community to come to and to feel welcomed into. And unfortunately, they still need to know that they're safe. And that is the sad reality. And by putting a flag up, you're taking away that little tiny, the huge burden that they have of knowing if they are safe in a place. So I encourage you to fly a flag at your home. To, I have a flag in my classroom, just so that anyone who walks in my classroom, because we don't know where people are, right? We don't know how if people are a member of the queer community. And it's really important for us to just send a really strong signal that you're safe here and you belong here and we want you here. So um, as an ally, I encourage everyone to have a pride flag in their home just because it's just a signal that we are safe for you. All right. All right, so I want you to think for a minute about have you ever talked to your children any children in your life, it could be your own children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, the neighbor next door. Um, have you ever talked to them about gender or LGBTQIA plus topics? And if you have, can you share out sort of what you did or how it felt? Um, or if you use any resources, that would be awesome too. Uh, yeah. I've talked to my grandson about it because I think he's old enough. And he has um, two friends that have now identified one as, uh, I hope I get the- It's okay. You're you're right. You're right. You're right. One who's not sure of her sexuality and sees herself both ways. Okay. What's that? What's that? So are they, they identify as male and female? Like are they trans? They, they, them. Okay. okay. They, them. I'm sorry. I don't remember all of them. So apologize. She's the same age as my grandson and, and they've known each other. So- we had discussions about how do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. uh, does it make you uncomfortable? What do you call her? And um, she says, you can still call me what you know me as. Right. So, so, okay. so he said, he's not that confused by it because uh, he just understands that people are different. Right. You know, and, and I, I got to get, I got to oh, get teary eye. I got to give him a lot of credit. I have two gay sisters. Okay. And he's had a lot of questions about them too. So okay. it's not that he isn't familiar with some yeah. of this stuff, you know, because he's yeah. seen it in it's our family. And he knows that my one sister has been with her companion for 38 years. Maybe. I wish I had one relationship. <laughs> and I have to say, he's. He's very, I think young people are more accepting than we think oh, yeah. they are. Oh. And I think, again, you have to be yeah. open about it and try to talk. We have a little flag outside. I have my little button on my pocketbook. Yeah. And, you know, I think we don't give them as much credit as we should because they are much more understanding than we are. 
Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. That statement right there is like the whole caveat mm -hmm. of this is that kids get this almost instantaneously. I teach first graders. These things come up all the time in my classroom and I am a very open teacher um, and luckily have the support of my mm -hmm. admin to be a very open teacher and kids instantaneously understand. They get it. And if they don't get it, they are not afraid or embarrassed to ask more and more questions until they do get it. So that's what I want to encourage you with today is that Although we might come to the conversation with our own fears or anxieties or, you know, worries, kids, they get it and they want to know. They want to know, they want to understand. And I have never encountered a conversation where I felt at the end like, oh, that went really badly when it came to kids. With adults, I felt it many times. Yeah. <laughs> but with kids, ultimately, they just want to know. They're so curious about everything in the world and this is just one other thing for them to learn about yeah well we had our daughter came to us uh, maybe only five or six years ago but i know that um she had had an experience uh, uh with a woman and she chose to get married and have children and she's bisexual and my grandson uh I haven't talked to him directly, but my son, I'm so proud of him because he he goes and plays with him for a couple hours every week. And um, he came out and said to, to my son that um, I don't know what I'm going to turn out to be. And uh, they talked a little bit about it. And then um, he said he wasn't attracted to either. So we're thinking he's like maybe asexual. Asexual, yeah. But uh, my son <laughs> said exactly what I would have wanted him to say. He just said, Mason, I'm going to love you no matter what you are, what you become, and what you do. Yeah. Just know that I will always love you and yeah. be here with you. So yeah. they're so proud of him. Awesome. Yes. Um, as a classroom teacher back in the 80s, um, all that we're speaking of was never present. Yeah. Right. yeah. However, different. young people were still struggling on the right. So without elongating the conversation, um, three times as a classroom teacher, I went with one of my students to their parents, holding their hand, shaking like this, the child was not me, mm -hmm. and to come out to their parents, which I personally believe is by far one of the most challenging things to do because hopefully, but not always, <laughs> hopefully these are the people that you never want to stop loving you. And therefore, you have the greater fear of losing that love. And they came out to me in an era that this was not talked about, but essentially said to me, I cry, <laughs> that they knew I was kind. And they were trusting that kindness, yeah. which... They had every right to because I would have done anything and they are still in my life. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people have done wonderful things with their lives and have given back to so many people and are worthy of our love and our respect. Um, so for me, it was an honor. It was an honor which spearheaded me then in a direction that I would not have thought of before as far as being an advocate at a time when, trust me, it really was not. Yeah the thing to be yeah. but Do if all you, the parents accept the children and they two out parents? of three uh, yeah and it took every ounce in me not to explode mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. i'm in that point where i never want that to have to be the conversation with my kiddo where where we never have to have this like moment yeah. this of anxiety um and i you know me i cry whenever i talk um, <laughs> but she's just getting to the point now where she's starting to talk about people, kids liking other kids. Mm -hmm. And we've always avoided the question, do you have a boyfriend? Mm -hmm. So I never want her to feel like that's my expectation, right? right? And so we try to avoid that altogether. Mm -hmm. But she's starting to talk about kids liking other kids. And I, oh, I said, oh, do you like anybody? And, and she mentioned, well, maybe this person. And I was like, you know, you got to say something because I said, what I want you to know is that just because daddy and I are in a boy girl relationship 
that is not our expectation for you mm -hmm. and that you can love whoever you love. And I want you to always feel like you can tell me if you like someone, no matter what they look like, who they are. I know. I, I think I like boys right now. I'm like, cool. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But just feel, you know, you can like who you like. And I don't know if that afterward, I was like, hmm, how'd that go? I don't know. But I it feel like, very, <laughs> I, feel like <laughs> I want her to know that the, our expectation is not that her relationships look like our relationships mm -hmm. because they're all good. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about this at the end, but I'll just talk about it now. It's really important as adults in children's lives to use inclusive language. So instead of saying, do you have a boyfriend? You can say, is there anyone you like? That's like a very simple way. And being explicit and saying to the children in your life, I don't care who you choose to love. Is that right there is a gift that you're giving to a child who maybe their parents aren't okay with it, or maybe they've never heard someone say it to them before. And also by starting out really young with lots of different things, you're opening their world up and you're allowing them to even have the possibility. They don't have to wait till they're 13, 14, or apparently fourth grade to start to feel like they, you know, when they start to feel attraction, that it's something to be uncomfortable about if they're not attracted to, if you're in a, you know, heterosexual relationship, that it's not okay for them not to kind of mimic you as an adult. So I will start with books are a great place to start the conversation. One, they are, there are so much good literature right now. When I started out as a librarian 11 or 18 years ago, it was almost impossible to find a queer character. It was almost impossible to find a family represented that wasn't a mom and a dad. We still have a very long way to go, but publishers are hearing the cry of people saying, we need to see ourselves in picture books. And there are so many great books coming out especially in the past, like since the pandemic, I don't know, like people really amped up their game. Um, they're really well done. They're really interesting. And when you have a book in front of you, the kids can look at it and they're taking in what they're ready to take in. And so today I'm going to talk to you about a whole bunch of books. Hi, how are you? Don't worry, don't apologize. All right, so before you kind of start the conversation, if you've never had a conversation about gender or sexuality, um, it's important that you think about the time and the place. Don't, it, sometimes it comes up naturally, which is great. But if you're like sitting down with the intention of starting this conversation, just make sure it's like a quiet time where you're not going to be interrupted and things like that. Also, it's really important that you lead, let your child lead. So follow their emotions, follow their signals. It, it's okay for them to feel however they're feeling and just really be open to knowing that you're not sure how that conversation is going to go with the child and to follow their lead. Honesty is also super important. I am a huge advocate of being honest with kids, even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable, even when you are like, oh, I don't know if I want to say this, say it because kids deserve to be treated and to, to be treated and to know what is happening and not to be fed a spoon fed story. I have had students, I had a student one time, here's just a classic example. She had a um, urinary problem and it was a known problem. And she came up to me and she said, my pocketbook hurts. And I was like, your pocketbook hurts. I'm like, did you pinch your finger? I'm like, like, this was like a five minute thing. And she's like getting frustrated with me. And I'm like, I don't, where's your pocketbook? Like, is it in your locker? And she pointed to her vagina and she had never heard the word vagina before. And this is a child who had a medical condition where she was prone to urinary tract infections. It's so important that we just are honest with kids, use body parts, real names, talk, talk to them about those things. How would you ever figure that one out? It took me a long time. It took me longer than it should have. Just see where it is. Right. That was exactly what it was. We got to like figure this out. And so I had a conversation with mom and I said, like, listen, it's really important that she can advocate for herself like please she needs to know the word vagina and the mom's like oh I can't say that word and she like would like walk away and I'm like oh my god like this is a child with a medical condition like we need to so just be honest with your kids use real terms talk about sexuality talk about gender it's not taboo it's okay to talk about and last be ready for questions kids ask they can ask some really good questions but things that you would never have thought about. So just be prepared for them. And it is okay to say to a child, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm going to look into it. 
but then make sure you get back to them with the answer to that question. So when you're looking for the right book, um, first, make sure it's diverse. Please don't pick books with only white people. Make sure that you are picking books that have all sorts of people, all sorts of families, all sorts of settings, country books, city books, all, just please make sure they're diverse. Make sure they're authentic. Um, look for authors who have had these life experiences. So look for someone who is a queer author. That's harder to find than I want to admit, but it is, especially in picture books, a little bit harder to find. But just in all your books, try and find an author who is living that life experience. Excuse me. Is there a site that we can go to? So at the end, I'm going to give you a bunch of um, Instagram and Facebook people. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Have incredible resources. Um, make sure the books are current. So there's some really old stuff out there that is really, really, really poorly done. So make sure that it is current and up to date, that it's talking about the topic in an appropriate way, and make sure you pre-read it because you don't want to be shocked by what's in there. Um, and then make sure it's fun. Don't pick a boring book with like lots and lots of words. Like pick a book with lots of pictures and lots of fun graphics and that has an interesting story just because it'll, you'll engage better in the conversation. Okay, so now we're getting to my favorite part, the books. First thing is, I think it's really important to talk to kids about their bodies because sex, our sex organs, our anatomy, um, is all linked to our sexuality. So I think that talking to kids openly about bodies is really important. A first step is bodies are cool. No one is ever naked in this book, but it shows all kinds. It's right here. I'm obsessed with this book and I apologize for my obsession. Um, it shows all kinds of people. You will be hard pressed to find a body that is not represented in this book. There are curvy women, there are very thin women, there's people with prosthetics, there's people with colostomy bags, there's people with um, diabetic, I don't, insulin pumps, like on their arms, there's people with hairy legs, there's people with not hairy legs. It represents every type of body. No one is ever naked, and it really just talks about how our bodies are awesome, and how everybody is awesome. So no matter what your body looks like, no matter how your body may be like someone else's or different, it's an awesome body. And <laughs> you could sit and just look at one page of pictures and have a whole conversation just based on one page of pictures. Your whole body is a new book to me. Um, one I love that it is a black baby on the front because too many times when we were talking about bodies, the person represented is a white person and that is not okay. This book does, I'm free warning, use the word penis, vagina, vulva. It talks about every body part. So if you want to have a conversation, particularly with a younger child, about what their body parts are called, this is a great place to start. And it shows um, it's not just a black baby the whole time, it's all different types of kids. Okay, so these are some questions that might come up. Your child might say to you, they've been talking about pronouns at church, which I hope that they are. Um, what are pronouns? So um, the first one, they, she, he, me, is literally, it says she, and then it shows all different ways that, well, do he. It shows all different ways you could be he. It shows a woman who presents as he, it shows men who present as he, it just shows all different ways to be he. Then it shows all different ways to be she, all different ways to be me. Um, it's a very, very simple book, but it opens the conversation up about how our pronoun might not exactly match what in the child's head they feel like he looks like and that I think is a huge important conversation could I just interject and I yes. apologize for doing but I just need to say people have questioned the pronouns yeah and I will would say to you how we are identified is how we first learn to love ourselves and have respect for ourselves so if we are being identified in an incorrect way that is sending a message to a child yes and therefore as much as we may have to struggle and we all do in some ways and our tongues get tripped that's okay because children i have found are so forgiving so and forgiving. Better than us. they are better than us <laughs> but you know I, I i don't want to see the pronouns be put aside because it's causing too much controversy or or agenda or whatever it's real it, it, it's so necessary 
And my response to that is if you have the luxury of not having to care about pronouns, then it is your responsibility to put it out there that what your pronouns are so that someone's pronouns who do not match their physical appearance doesn't feel uncomfortable sharing what their pronoun is. So it is an easy way to be an advocate. It is an easy way to invite someone in and to say to someone, if your pronoun doesn't match exactly how I'm viewing you, that's okay. I still love you. Yeah. You're fine. Thank you. You can go, go, go. Sorry, I'm just like blocking your exit. Thanks for being here. <laughs> it feels good to be yourself. It's just a really good book. It just says this is Ruthie. And then it explains what Ruthie likes. And it says Ruthie is a transgender girl. And it just gives like a very simple, very basic explanation of um, transgender, uh, non-binary, and it does non-binary both ways. Um, it It's just a great introduction to the idea of different types of sexuality and gender. And children's books are great for adults to read <laughs> because they give you the language to use. And it's very simple. Like <laughs> some of these topics can be hard and it can be hard to think about and you're overwhelmed by it. These are very simple. What are your words I don't have because it was checked out of the library. Also, every book I'm talking about today is available at the Montgomery County Library System. So you do not have to go and purchase it. You can absolutely borrow it from the public library. Um, what are your words is my favorite book to introduce pronouns. I read it this year at the start of the school year with my students. We recommended that Sunday school teachers read it at the start of the school year this year. It does a great job. There's a little boy in the story who is unsure. He he changes his pronouns daily, and he's unsure that day what his pronoun will be. So his uncle, who um, identifies, I think, as they, walks him. They're kind of like walking through the neighborhood having a conversation about it, and they say like, oh, here's Mary, she's the male person, and they identify as their pronouns are they. And it's just like a very simple way to introduce the idea that there are different ways we can express our pronouns. Steph, we have these books in church too, right? We have some of these books in church. Okay. At the very end, we're going to have a QR code that you can scan if you'd like to donate a book to our <laughs> library. How about a reading list? So people know what to look for. In the yes, and I will, I'm going to send you this too, Great. so okay. you will definitely have this. Okay. Breaking gender norms is a huge thing for me, um, especially as a classroom teacher. I cannot stand when my children come in and say, pink is for boys, you can't like that. It rip, literally, I want to rip my hair out when they say it. So pink is for boys is an amazing book. And it says pink is for boys. And then it lists things that you can color that are pink. And then the next page says pink is for girls. And it lists all the things you can color that are pink. Blue is for girls, and it lists all the things you can color that are blue. Blue is for boys. So it just introduces the idea that a color is a color. It is not gendered. <laughs> My Own Way is a very, again, very basic, very simple way of talking about you can be who you are, and it can change every day, and what you wear can change every day, and how you identify can change every day. Just a really simple introduction. And except when they don't, starts out really <laughs> I started reading it and I was like, what is this book about? It's like, <laughs> girls have tea parties and wear tutus and do ballet. And then the next page says, boys are superheroes and play football and like the color blue. And then you turn the page and it says, except when they don't. <laughs> and then it has boys in tutus and girls and football pads. And it's every page is like, it's like two pages of what gender norms for me and then you turn the page and it's except when they don't and it shows all kinds of ways that you can be who you are okay i think it's really important that your home library that your library that you have with your children includes lgbtqia plus families it you have to be intentional about it because there's not a million of them out there and do not choose a story where being gay is the issue is the problem that is not okay you need to include families that are just families and they happen to be queer families. Babe the Cat is a hysterical book about two dads who are trying to get ready for grandma to come and they're like in a panic, like the house is a mess and we need to get it cleaned up. And they make a list and the cat keeps coming over and like switching it up. So it's instead of like vacuum the floor, it's like 
vacuum the cat and, and the whole thing is the cat doesn't want a bath and in the end everything gets done but the cat doesn't get a bath i love it for a couple of reasons one it's a gay family two it is an interracial family which is hugely important and three it's just a funny story and honestly your kid probably isn't even going to notice that it's two dads but it's just a way to make sure that you're including them in your home libraries love makes a family is a beautiful story about it's just love makes a family is what it says on every page but the illustrations show all different types of families grandmoms with their children um moms and dads a huge extended families that live together and then also queer families granddad's camper which we have thanks to gail <laughs> is one of my new favorites um it deals so granddad it granddad's partner passed away and he and his partner used to um, travel in their camper van all over England, or I'm still assuming it's said in England because we don't call them camper vans. Um, but they used to travel and granddad is sad and he no longer is traveling and he's just not himself. And the little girl in the story acknowledge, like sees that he's not himself and she takes him on a camping trip. So it deals with the issue of death and loss, but it also has a queer family. And again, it's a biracial family. And Tango Makes Three, this used to be the only book, <clears throat> literally the only book that you could have that talked about anything other than a man and a woman or two, a male and a female having a baby. It's penguins. Um, there are two penguins, I forget which zoo it's at, who were essentially mated partners and they wanted to have a baby so badly. They would carry rocks, they would steal other penguins' eggs. And so the keepers were like, well, let's just try it out. Like, let's give them an egg and see what they do. And they raise the egg and it's a really great story. And if you're like feeling a little nervous about like people, animals are a very gentle way to sort of step into um, the topic. But this used to be it. Like that was the only option you had up until probably six or seven years ago. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, mommy, Mama, and Me in the Middle is a story about a mom who leaves on a work trip. She has to go away on a work trip. So the little girl stays with mama and she misses mommy the whole time and they do special things. And then when she comes back, um, the little girl is excited, but also sad about all the things that mommy missed while she was away. So again, it's just a story about a family. It's something that might come up in your household. Um, and it's just a way, again, your kids probably won't even notice, but that you can include um, a queer family. And again, it's a biracial family. <laughs> okay, transgender is one I know a lot of people struggle with talking um, to their kids about because maybe they feel uncomfortable about it or they're not exactly sure how to explain it. Julian is a mermaid is a beautiful story about a little boy who's riding the subway with his grandmother and he sees um, some people in drag and one of them is driving the mermaid and he says, I want to be that mermaid. And it's really great because you have this suspense, like you're not, grandma doesn't show her hand right away and you're not sure how grandma's gonna feel about it. And she kind of like leaves the room and he's sort of left with this angst of like, what does grandma think? And she comes back with like a beautiful tablecloth and a headdress. And then she takes him to a drag, what appears to be a drag show at the end of the um, story. But this one is super important because the child is brown. And it is our brown and black people are not represented in queer books as often as they should be. And it is really important if you have any children that are brown to make sure that you're representing them and queer stories as well. Red is a really easy way to tip your toe into the idea of transgender. Red is a crayon who is blue, but his wrapper is red. So everyone assumes that he is a red crayon. And so when he colors, things that should be red they are blue and people are like well you're not you don't match you're not what you should be or you're different and then he explains <laughs> that his outside doesn't match how he feels on the inside that is so clever yeah, it's, it is it's, clever. it's really good and it's a very easy way to just tip your toe into the idea that like we don't our wrapping on our outside doesn't always match how we feel on the inside neither is a very funny story about a chicken and a bunny have a baby and it's neither and he doesn't fit in with the chickens and he doesn't fit in with the bunnies because he's neither 
he's not a chicken or a bunny, he's who he is. And it's just another great way to sort of step your toe into the idea that like, we don't have to fit into what the prescribed boxes are. The Boy and His Bindi is brand new to me. And it is the first book that I have seen um, an Indian character represented in a way um, outside of the binary. So the little boy in the story asks his mom about her bindi, which is the dot that um, Indian and Hindu women put on their head. And it I didn't know what the bindi meant either. It also does a great job of explaining what a bindi is. It opens their eyes to experience the world fully. And it is traditionally worn only by women. And he wants a bindi. And his mom puts one on his head and then he can experience the world fully. So it's just a really beautiful story about stepping outside um, of your um, cultural norms. I think some men should wear bindis. <laughs> <laughs> they could open their world a bit. <laughs> yes. Now, when you're ready for the big conversation, when Aiden became a brother is a story about a boy who transitions. He is born female. He, his family identifies him as female, and then he, he appears to be about school age when they decide, when he decides that he does not feel female, he feels male. And his family does a great job embracing that. And in this story, mom is pregnant with a baby, which I think is a really interesting conversation. And he is worried about misgendering the baby. He doesn't want the baby to feel the way that he felt where, for years where he was misgendered, which is heartbreaking as a parent to think that that was how he felt, but also an important conversation. And he plays a really big role in like deciding how to paint the baby's nursery and deciding um, what kind of clothes the baby should have. And they pick very gender neutral things. And then he feels really good about his baby coming into the world and not feeling and choosing whether they feel male or female as, a, as opposed to being assigned to that. Hmm. It's a beautiful story. And again, can I just, I'll go ahead. Yes. I just, um, are there plenty of white people also represented? Because you yes. just want to give children the impression that yes. only people of color so my, are involved. In this is my own community. Yes. No, there, it's overwhelmingly white. Mm -hmm. um, this is me searching for people who aren't white, basically. Um, it is overwhelmingly white. Um, this day, so another question might come up in June is what is Pride? What is Pride Month? What does it mean? This day in June and the Rainbow Parade are both about Pride celebrations and Pride is the story of Harvey Milk. So they're just great introductions into what is a Pride Parade. This day in June is really just about a parade and all the things that you might see. The Rainbow Parade is about a little girl who goes with her moms to a parade and at the end it says, um, celebrating LGBTQIA plus families. And she feels nervous about marching, not because her mom, because she has two moms, but just because she feels nervous and her mom's kind of talk her through it. And then they march in a parade. Mm -hmm. And it's based on a true story. The author um, was raised by two women and um, had this exact feelings and emotions during a pride parade. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes. When did the word queer become okay? So queer has been <clears throat> taken back but some people feel uncomfortable with it still. I do not. I find it easier to say than LGBTQIA plus. It's just a lot in my head. <laughs> when I grew up, absolutely. I'm sure when you guys were, you know, it was sort of really inappropriate. It has been taken back. It has been accepted um, as just an umbrella term for LGBTQIA plus. And for me, it's just easier to say than LGBTQIA plus. But if you feel uncomfortable about it or if you feel like it has a negative connotation, don't use it. No, I don't feel uncomfortable. I just wanted you to yes. get that. It's yeah. one of those words that that, uh, that only people that are members of that community should use or I'm okay for anybody. I'm not a member of that community and I've never had someone say that it's offensive to me to use that term. Um, but if someone did say to me, I don't like when you use that term, it feels uncomfortable, I wouldn't use it anymore. Um, but did you ever, Jenny, did you ever experience? You no, know, th there is a little bit of disagreement in the LGBTQIA plus community about it. I think that there's not a universal acceptance that that is a word that, you know, in, because in some places it does, it is still used as a derogatory yeah. term. Yeah. So I would use it with caution yeah. for sure. 
And I will, the other thing that I'll say is I generally tend to say LGBTQIA plus all the time. And the reason that I do it is because that community has not traditionally been given permission to take up space. Mm -hmm. And so say, like for me, I then say all the letters as an act of mm -hmm. defiance, right? But they say it and take up the space mm -hmm. and own the space for that community. So I tend, that is what I tend to say. But yeah, so I'd say there's still a little bit of agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. I just wanted to thank for older people in that community, my, both my sisters, for them to hear peer being acceptable now is really uh, surprising. Yeah. I've talked to my sisters about it and they, they just, because when they were younger, you didn't even come out or do anything. Yeah. And they're just shocked that the, that they use the word queer now is very acceptable. Yeah. Again, I think proceed with caution. And if someone feels uncomfortable with it, you stop. That's your job. You know, if it makes someone feel uncomfortable, then you don't use that term anymore. All right. Helping kids become advocates and allies, which I think is ultimately what we want. Um, first, you have to practice. Kids need to know what to do in a situation. I love social stories. A social story is just a, um, you give an idea. So let's say um, I would say to my child, your friend came up to you and said that they want to be called they, them. They want to use the they, them pronouns. And then talking with your child about how you would go about that conversation and what you would say. Um, it's a really simple way to give kids practice because kids need practice to feel comfortable. Sorry, everybody. Right. No, you're yeah. fine. Go, go, go. Of course. And I thought I didn't have enough. I was going to say, you were worried you didn't have enough to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, flying a flag in your home, in your workspace, making sure that people know that you are a safe person and that having your child have a flag. My children both have flags in their bedrooms as well so that if they have a friend over, they know that they are a safe person. You're fine. Mm -hmm. um, go to pride events or pride rallies as a family, as an ally, make them feel comfortable and included in that. And then also just using inclusive language, making sure that you as a family avoid gender norms and that you um, use as much inclusive language as possible. Here's those resources that I promised you. Um, Kid That Mama is my favorite. She does a really good job of coming up with books on all kinds of tough topics, like grief, um, school shootings. Um, and then she also does fun stuff like Halloween. So she's really good. I have a book for that, it is another great person for really great resources. And the tiny activists is they focus mostly on social justice issues. And then I'll put this up here. UDLC is working really hard to have an inclusive library for our kids to look at. And you can scan that and it will take you to an Amazon wish list where you can purchase books for our inclusive children's library. Share with friends. Share with friends. Exactly. And I thank you. Very good. Very good. Sorry. I was, I feel like I was like racing through. No, that no, no, no. And I'll share my. So you'll help me make sure that we get it mm -hmm. to whomever. Yeah. Okay. I will share my slides so that you have the books, the book resources. If you have questions, my email address is at the very end. I'm always happy to talk about books particularly, but I'm also happy to talk about anything that you have questions about. I'm not an expert, but I will guide you in the right direction. Thank well, you. we thank you so much. Thank you. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your willingness to do what you did today. Oh, yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Perfect. Let me. Can we stop sharing or stop recording? I think we're going to need to I should have told you. I was coming here. I didn't even realize. Oh, my son. Oh, my son.